Welcome to MuggleCast. Before we get started with today's episode, we wanted to share an email from Mahira, which captures the current events of the last week and how it relates to the story that we love so much. She says, One of the joys of rereading Harry Potter is how both we and our world change each time we reread the books. It was interesting listening to last week's chapter with Hogwarts's rebellion against Umbridge during a week where protesters, demanding justice for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and the countless others who have been the victims of police brutality against Black people in the United States. I think this chapter and other parts of Order of the Phoenix demonstrates many of the types of protests we've been seeing this past week. In the United States, we've seen everything from peaceful protests to targeted destruction of property. For example, the Minnesota police station. I'd compare that to the Weasley twins. Book clubs sharing resources for learning about the history of racism against people of color, Dumbledore's army, donating to bail funds for those arrested while protesting, McGonagall helping peeves, full-on destruction, peeves, violence against police, attacking the inquisitorial squad, direct interference with oppression, the Niffler in Umbridge's office, and even facing arrests and punishment for standing up against injustice, for example, the four successive classes of students in detention. Obviously, these aren't perfect connections, and I do not want to minimize the nuances of systemic racism in the U.S. However, I think this chapter speaks to how rule-breaking, deviance, and refusing to participate is often justified when the deviance is against an unfair system. As someone with both rule-following tendencies and social justice orientation of Hermione Granger, I think this chapter points to times when we should no longer comply with injustice and the many ways we can stand up. There have been plenty of pieces by black activists on philosophies of protest for civil rights. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail is maybe my favorite starting point that better articulate how we can recognize and stand up for what is right. However, as someone who grew up with Harry Potter, there is something comforting in finding examples in my favorite series. Thank you, Mahira. Yeah, thank you so much for that. We wanted to take a moment to make some space here on the show to recognize what has happened to people like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and countless others, and say that we stand against white supremacy and there is no place for it in this show community. And we're very, very encouraging of our base to take advantage of the resources and educate yourselves. Um, We'll provide some of that in our show notes. Some of it has been up on our social channels this past week. You can definitely find it in this week's show notes. Damn straight. Yep. No, I mean it really. That And that's, you know, to break the tension, but honestly, it's true. We all believe that. We feel that way. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Yep. Also, we wanted to let everybody know that we recorded this episode prior to J.K. Rowling tweeting about trans people again. We find her latest comments transphobic and hurtful to the LGBT community, and they came at the worst possible time for a variety of reasons. We will be addressing what she said on next week's episode. So welcome to MuggleCast, and on today's episode of the show, we will be discussing Chapter 31 of Order of the Phoenix, O-W-L-S. Are we saying it that way, or are we just going to say owls? I like O-W-L-S, I really do. Okay, sure. You have to say it like Umbridge, though, in the movie. Ordinary wizarding levels. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god. Please um, don't. I've been meaning to say, Eric, your impersonation of Umbridge was very, very good. Oh, thank you. It was very well received. I, I can't remember the last time I got so many emails about a particular thing that I said. <laughs> wow. Show. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. This is yeah. Eric's acting for, chops for, coming this in. This was positive feedback, too, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to- Look gonna, at that. Uh, I'm going to have to go on tour as an Umbridge impersonator. You're, you're making Umbridge likable. I almost said great again, but yeah. likable. I feel a little uncomfortable, but uh, it was positive uh, feedback, and I really liked. We should do more of those read-alongs where all of us kind of pitch mm, yeah. in for. I agree. Big yeah. scenes. Oh, that was a great idea Speaking on my of part. That. <sighs> anyway, so <laughs> let's look at the latest chapter readings over at WizardingWorld.com. Speaking of readings, um, the latest ones are Whoopi Goldberg, 
Micah, your mom was right. Yeah, how about that? And then the next chapter was read by Fantastic Beast stars Dan Fogler and Allison Sudol. And, uh, of course, they play Jacob and Queenie in the Fantastic mm-hmm. Beast movies. They should have been on the set right now, but instead they're in <laughs> quarantine like everybody else, and now they're rereading a book from 20 years ago. So <laughs> I actually, seeing them, I actually feel like I'm really starting to miss that film franchise. Like I feel like right about now is the time when I would want to be getting that first teaser of completed footage and really starting to get excited about a third entry in the franchise. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I was thinking about that too, because when they start filming, they might share some more details about the plot or maybe the title. And we're going to have to wait a little right. while longer, though. My understanding is they have gotten approval. I saw a news report. They've gotten approval to start or they've laid their guidelines Ooh. out for how they're going to film safely. And they've been approved no. by the government. Ooh. I know there's a big focus for Fantastic Beasts three taking place in rio but i'm sure people have been following the news brazil has skyrocketed in its number of cases of coronavirus Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. i wonder how that is going to impact filming if in fact they plan to do anything on location that's a really good point i bet they would cancel their shooting over there i mean they may try to keep all filming at leaveston in light of coronavirus How about they just rewrite Fantastic Beasts 3 again, use all those Harry Potter sets that are over in the studio tour. Yeah, why don't we just get a a close-up of Hogwarts, the whole whole movie? (laughs) It's just that's all set at Hogwarts. And it's Dumbledore and Newt picking up on their conversation from directly when the second one ended. Yeah. Yeah. Dumbledore tells all. I I just want to go off something that was said about seeing Dan Fogler and Alison Sudol. I I think the other piece of this is, you know, we didn't know what to expect when a new franchise was created, but I think you can tell the passion with which Mm -hmm. these actors and actresses, uh, you know, talk about and read the Harry Potter series, uh, even Eddie Redmayne when he did his chapter. Mm -hmm. Um, But if, if folks haven't gone and listened to any chapters yet, I highly recommend this chapter with Dan Fogler and and Allison Sudol. I know we we were talking about it during the week, but Dan Fogler, <laughs> the voices that he adds to <laughs> every character, that like he he really gets into it. Like he is a modern day Jim Dale um or Stephen Fry, like he he really embodies all of it. Like his wow. even his Madam Hooch, like he he's into it the entire time. <laughs> Better than Whoopi? Yeah, sorry. Uh <laughs> 100% I would say just completely committed to the characters and there's a couple of uh Gilly Water moments too which are funny. Oh cool. <laughs> well, you mentioned coronavirus and right before starting recording this week's episode of MuggleCast, I was on wizardingworld.com and I also just noticed this, so I thought I would mention it. There are going to be officially licensed Harry Potter face coverings, face masks coming, I guess sometime this summer. Um I guess it's not too much of a surprise. And speaking of things reopening, Universal Orlando is starting to reopen. And of course, that's where the Wizarding World of Harry Potter is. And face masks are going to be required. So I wonder if they're going to try to sell these at the parks. And if so, they're going to be hot sellers. But they need a little hole in Mm. it to uh, sip your butterbeer through. Though I guess that would (laughs) defeat the purpose. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, they, they've definitely done, uh, on the soft open I saw at Universal, the Frog Chorus. And the Bobatons and Durmstrang students all have masks now as part of their... What? Uh, yes, as part of their uniforms. <laughs> that must sound awful. Do the frogs have face masks? It, the, uh, you know, I'm not it sure. It actually sounds better, Andrew. <laughs> Does Hagrid have a face mask on Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure? I don't think everyone does, but it was about- interesting. There were photos that came out of the... the the uh, Durmstrang and Bobatons. Bobatons are wearing mostly like an entire head scarf and it's black, not blue. So I feel like it's probably the first generation of what we're seeing. Eric, what about your dance partner, Celestina Warbeck? <laughs> she famously refuses to wear a mask. She's such a diva. Oh, what um, a diva. Somebody did say that she did not have a mask on. So. Oh my Does gosh. Does the blast and its scroots, you know what, 
have a face covering. I, <laughs> that could have used the face covering way before coronavirus. Oh my gosh. But, they should absolutely put a giant mask on that thing. But... That would be hilarious. I really feel strongly that they should. I, I wonder too, uh, if they had legitimate discussions about if they could create the bubble head charm and utilize that on people as um, a way of, you know, legitimate uh, discussions. Pla- yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in place of masks, you know, could yeah, they yeah. come up with something that would have looked consistent with the Potter series, but would right. still protect the people who are working there? They would have got giant fish bowls and put them on staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's an interesting idea, though. Kind of like breathing into a plastic bag. I wouldn't right, want to yeah. do it for too long. A little long. dangerous. <laughs> um, I, I will just note that the companies partnering with Wizarding World have committed to making a variety of donations to charities, actively supporting first responders, underserved communities, and others impacted by the spread of COVID-19. So, so I was suggesting, I, I thought you were going to say at first that this was the first perk of Wizarding World Gold of being a <laughs> member is you're going to get a face mask sent to you. No. It should okay. be. I mean, yeah, like, I what's haven't been going used on over there. With nothing. Gold? Absolutely okay. nothing. All right. All right. We have an email now. This is from Sophie. Just listened to your latest episode and thought it was funny that punting means something different for British and American because punting means something even more different here in Australia. It means what? gambling <laughs> or betting on something particularly in sports such as football or horse racing. So reading the books here, it sounds like Filch is betting on students who will make it across the swamp or not. (laughs) I did know the British term, however, as I actually went punting around Cambridge on a holiday once, so I could self-translate. Who would have thought there would be so many meanings to one word, Sophie says. Yeah, that's crazy. (laughs) I think I like the Australian reading of this. Best of all. Betting? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) This might be the most confusing scene worldwide in the Harry Potter books. <laughs> Nobody knows yeah. what's happening. It's all lost in translation. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be, uh, it be. It actually sounds like it, the, the Australian definition would be something that Fred and George would actually do, not fill, bet on students who could actually make it across the swamp and that could tie be a like a of, whole thing into it. Yeah, True. that could be a point of connection between the, the twins and Filch. They're all betting men. Well, before we get to chapter by chapter, this week's episode of MuggleCast is sponsored by an app that can greatly improve your life. It's Beachbody On Demand. They are the easy-to-use streaming service that gives you instant access to over 1,300 super effective workouts, and they're suited for anybody at any time. The secret to getting results is getting started. Once you try Beachbody On Demand, you're going to notice you're feeling better. You're going to feel more productive for having worked out, and you're going to have more energy during the day because you got to get that blood moving. And best of all, Beachbody On Demand lets you achieve your goals from the comfort and safety of home, and it's much cheaper than a gym membership. Beachbody On Demand is the place to go for at-home workouts. This is the company behind all the routines like P90X, Insanity, and 21 Day Fix. Now check out some of Beachbody's newest programs like Morning Meltdown, 80 Day Obsession, and start every day strong. Workouts are as short as 10 minutes, and they don't require extra equipment, so they're easy to fit into your life. And when quarantine ends, you're going to want to stick with Beachbody On Demand because you're going to be seeing results and feeling better. Plus, you can work out wherever you have your phone, tablet, or TV. Beachbody will always be with you. I really want you to try this app because I know firsthand these workouts work. Just start with smaller workouts if you don't already have a fitness routine, and I promise you, you're going to be feeling better right after your first workout because you're going to be moving, you're going to be getting that blood flowing, like I'm saying, like I said, and you're just going to feel better, I promise. Right now, our listeners can get a special free trial membership when you text MuggleCast to 303030. You will get full access to the entire platform for free. All the workouts, all the nutrition information, and support totally free. Again, just text MuggleCast to 303030. Do it right now. It's so easy to get started, unless you're driving. Text MuggleCast to 303030. Okay, and let's move on to chapter by chapter now, and we will start, as always, with our seven-word summary. It's been a while since I've had to start one of these things. Uh Uh-oh. Pressure's on. Don't say Harry. Don't say Harry. Don't say Harry. Exams. Ken... Pause. Severe. Headaches. 
and visions. Perfect. Woo! Nice. If everybody doesn't give us a A plus <laughs> plus for that, yeah, then that was I don't outstanding, know what to tell you. y'all. I'm I'm quite proud of that yep. actually. <laughs> There was no, not even one mention of a of a Harry Potter character in that. So <laughs> think about how much restraint that mm -hmm. uh, that takes. All right, exams are here. It it's, it actually fits quite well because we're in the month of June, and, and oh, yeah. normally I feel like right now a lot of students would be, um, if not for coronavirus, uh, sitting their final exams. But we'll we'll get to that in a little bit. The chapter starts out with a little bit of tough news for Ron, but Ron's able to get it o get over it pretty quickly, and that is that Harry and Hermione, they weren't at the Quidditch match. They didn't see him win the cup for Gryffindor, and um, yeah, it, it's it's a little heartbreaking for Ron at first, but he is able to quickly get over it because. Harry and Hermione have this story about Grop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ron's victory has really emboldened him, or it's just kind of set him straight. He has spent most of the book really down on his um, wits and happiness because of his failure to really win at Quidditch, but now that he's done it, it, it really feels like he's a new man, and his first order is to like completely forgive Hermione and Harry for leaving the match just because, like, and he gets immediately invested in the story of Grop and is equally outraged as they are when the story's finished. And there's a couple examples, you know, I'll touch on later of Ron behaving almost not Ron-like because he's super zen. He was the MVP last week that I gave to him, and I just say, Ron, great job at defending the goals. <laughs> I would be really bummed if I were Ron because, of course, this was his big moment and his best friends weren't there to see it. Yeah. I don't I wouldn't care about this Grop story, I don't think. Like I would care, but I would still be bummed. It wouldn't cancel out my bummedness over them missing it. Right. And they've let him go on for days about yeah. the match under the assumption that they were there. Yeah, that, Ron, that was such a great save. Well, yeah. they they but they're the least two people that would need to have seen it to believe it. Right, True. like they always support. They always support Ron. I, I think it helps that the whole darn school saw it. Besides Harry and Hermione, it's too bad ca uh, cameras don't capture these games. Like, oh, yeah, games would be captured in the real world. I mean, even in high school, they're typically filmed by the AV club. But of <laughs> course, that can't happen here in the Wizarding World. Maybe now it does. So Ron's friends don't miss any more of his matches. <laughs> it does set him up well. Uh, for the future and, and does give him that boost of confidence. Even if it's only for this short period of time, it, it's nice to see Ron with a little bit of uh, confidence because we're, we're so used to him feeling sorry for himself in a lot of ways. Yeah. 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 And, and, but he's able to be so objective with all of this stuff. Like he says to them after they tell the story of Grop, he says, have we ever come off better from mixing with one of Hagrid's monster mates. Like, remember Norbert? Remember Aragog? Like, he sees, here's Ron laying down the, down the smackdown of, like, we've never enriched ourselves or come off better by dealing with Hagrid's messes. Yeah. Why should we start now? That was and a genius it, observation. Absolutely. It sounds like one we made on last week's episode, so I don't know. Maybe <laughs> Ron listens to the show. <laughs> it makes you wonder, what if Ron said that to Hagrid? What would Hagrid have said? Ooh, that's... maybe Ron is responsible for what happens at the end of the chapter because he's angry that Hagrid took Harry and Hermione away from the Quidditch match. <laughs> <laughs> Grop's different, Ron. Don't worry. Nothing will go wrong. <laughs> one interesting observation that's made by Harry in the beginning of this chapter when Ron is going through and and really just talking Quidditch, right? He's explaining how strategically he went about doing what he did. And, and they're out there by the lake sitting under the beech tree. And it's really a throwback to James. And, and Harry is able for a very brief moment just to kind of enjoy it and watching yeah. Ron as if he, wa he was watching his dad. <laughs> yeah. That is an interesting turning point in the Harry internal debate. Uh, like evolution between him and, and and who his father was to be able to look at Ron and be like, oh, he's being very James-like right now and not being like, 
upset about it. It was sad to see, though. It just reminded Harry of his father, of that memory he experienced. And it was also kind of beautiful because Ron was feeling as confident as James did back in the day. I'm going to say they got to plant more trees at Hogwarts because this is the one beech tree that I mean, <laughs> I mean, this is the same beech tree that was there in the 70s that James was under. There's no other beech tree. Every time they go out on the Hogwarts grounds, they're always under the beech tree. There's surely a line of people waiting right. to sit under this tree in the shade. And, and the only other tree that's there will try and attack you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We need more <laughs> peaceful trees at Hogwarts. Mm. shade nightmare <laughs> no shade available it's, it's just like the wizarding world in orlando there's no shade there at diagon there's, alley there is but not the other there's one there's probably a, a shield charm for the skin i would say it was going to say you need to go to uh, nocturne alley if you want some air conditioning down in uh, <laughs> orlando i'm sure that's true in the books as well but uh, harry does make use of everything that's going on uh, to notice that Nobody has really pursued Snape teaching him occlumency. And remember, this is something that Remus and Sirius talk with him about, and Hermione has been consistently nagging him about over the course of the last few chapters since Snape has stopped lessons with him. And uh, yeah, this is not good given what happens at the end of this chapter. Yeah. But Harry's like, oh, I can skate by. Nobody's paying attention to me and my occlumency that I'm supposed to be having. It's kind of a shame, but I think we've really all been there when we have, especially as a teenager, when you have just slightly too much on your plate, um, you're able to skate by in inaction and kind of bask in other people being distracted. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine Harry, even if he was taking lessons with Snape and progressing, focusing on occlumency with all the exams that he has currently yeah in front of him and look at hermione she's a mess throughout this chapter yeah for her but it's true if he, if he's supposed to empty his mind be before every lesson how are you going to do that when this is the time of year when you really have to retain information and and regurgitate and do all this stuff with your head it just harry wasn't good at it to begin with he's not going to be good at it now during exam season yep mm -hmm. it's really the perfect storm well, before we get to talking about the exams themselves, uh, we do get a little bit of uh, career advice from Draco Malfoy. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> when when he says, uh, you know what, at the end of the day, these tests, they don't really matter. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And <laughs> I just have visions of like corporate nepotism and other things <laughs> pop up when uh, when I heard this, because I do think there is something to that. And I think there's a reason why J.K. Rowling included it uh, in in the story, and mm -hmm. particularly that it comes from Draco with his father and, and his influence at the ministry. Oh, yeah. Maybe Lucius is buying Draco a cushy seat somewhere with all that gold. Well, and also reminds me of what's been going on recently with this college admissions scandal with Aunt oh. Becky mm -hmm. and a, a bunch of other celebrities. Yeah. Bribing schools to get their kids into college. <laughs> I mean, it's awful. Well, and, and it, there's also something Dudley-ish about it. Draco's like, oh, we've had Griselda Marchbanks over for tea. Mm -hmm. She's, she and my, she and father are real close. Yeah. And it's like, oh, come on, man. That's, ugh. And then Neville's like, I don't think that's true. <laughs> he co totally calls <laughs> fake news on that moment. <laughs> yeah. He does. He does. And Ron, with ever the worldview, is like, there's nothing we can do about it if it is true <laughs> to mm -hmm. Harry when he's like, is Draco really like cheating his way to the top? Ron is just so peaceful right now that he's won. He's still riding the high of his victory and nothing can perturb him. Yeah, it's it's quite a moment because I think that we probably can all identify at least one person that whether it was college, whether it's been at the office where we work where we we know somebody who is there not necessarily because of of the work that he or she has done to get there but because of just who they are yeah i know that you deal with that all the time andrew with brooklyn <laughs> i was trying to come up with a joke about one of you three but i couldn't yeah because we've all worked really hard to get where we are and andrew's like oh i can't undermine them there's no jokes here <laughs> I think some very real topics come, not just in this chapter come up, but in this book, right? And mm -hmm. and that's why it is so interesting to be having this conversation 
about you know education and 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 some of the things that happen at the end of this chapter given both current events but also just the fact that we're adults and so we see this all through a different perspective than mm-hmm. we did when we first read uh, order the phoenix yeah i i definitely distinctly remember especially when i was in grad school like you recognized who was there <laughs> based on uh, their academic work and who was there because of, you know, money, right? Um, totally. Mm-hmm. And those differences very much stand out. I'm sure, Micah, you probably had something similar in your own program. Yeah, it's discouraging, though, because you're like, education should be here for the betterment of people. And instead, you have some portion of the population that's very privileged financially and is able to buy their way through in order to pad their resume. And I think that's what Draco represents here. Mm. I've always wondered if Draco is a good student though. Mm. I know in this moment, it seems like there's a bit of nepotism going on, but I wonder how good his grades actually are. I feel like somewhere and somewhere recently we read that they were near Hermione esque levels like even though Lucius gives Draco a run for his money Draco's grades I think are pretty good I can't remember where I heard that but I I really think that he's actually getting good grades in school despite being a total prat yeah I've gotten the impression he values a good education yeah yeah I think this is just bluster like and and it's the kind of thing we tell ourselves as well like oh it'll be okay it's like This is not that pressing when, in fact, internally we're freaking out about it. Yeah, well, well, I wonder how would we react to taking two straight weeks of (laughs) standardized testing? Sounds terrible. I know, right? Yeah. I I remember back to, at least in New York State, we had regents exams. I'm not sure what they're called in other states or if there's standardized testing that that are put forth by the state, but... It, there was always a lot of pressure going into these exams because they were determining your future, right? They they mm-hmm. were going to have an impact on whether or not you got into a, a college. And if mm-hmm. you did, what college were you going to get into? And it also makes me think a lot about the PSATs and the SATs, oh. which I know are more universal across the US. So I, I would just be curious to hear other experiences. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I grew up in a in a few different states, but no matter where you went, standardized testing was the law of the land. And in a couple of cases, like in Texas and Georgia, if you did poorly enough on your yearly standardized test, it could hold you back. Mm. Like in some cases, when you took those exams, it was just for state funding, which is a whole other conversation. Um, (laughs) But there were some cases where it actually determined whether or not you were able to go on to the next grade. So if you came in and you had a bad day taking this standardized test, it could completely impact your entire next year of schooling. In Pennsylvania, they were called the PSSAs. And I remember doing them. I think they were a successive, like successive mornings in in the week but i do remember like we had enough prep that we would come into school the first couple periods of the day would be devoted to testing in like the cafeteria and then we'd go about our days but i i feel like if i can remember how i felt during this testing i felt invigorated to like like because all the studying that i was ever gonna do was done and then it was like here's just where you sit down and show us what you know right Right. like you just you just get rid of your knowledge and i kind of Liked that. And of course, the knowledge escaped my brain, went onto the paper and never came back. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah, that's what happens. You cram and then you do well, hopefully, and then you forget all this information. Yeah. So it's like, (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean, we could have a whole episode talking about the effectiveness of standardized testing. Um, (laughs) But one thing that I would like to highlight here that I think is a little different. I mean, owls are clearly a form of standardized testing. Uh, But what's different from the U.S., of course, is that these are written exams and practical exams, um, Mm -hmm. you know, where students have some control over 
the content, right? Whereas like when you're taking a standardized test in the US, it's questions and a Scantron and you bubble in your answers and you're either right or you're wrong. So yeah. I think what we're seeing here is a little bit better, but two successive weeks of exams is a lot, especially yeah, when you're telling so much. a 15 year old, like think about where you were mentally at 15. Like, Hey, if you screw this up, it completely determines your career trajectory for the rest of your life. Yeah. That's a lot of pressure. I also wonder if it's different because it's a boarding school, right? They live here. So like two weeks, like having all their exams spread out over two entire weeks feels actually like a dream to me. Just because that's, that's a good so point. Additional time. I mean, yeah, I, my exams were similar to this where you would you would get that entire day just to focus on that particular exam. So you you weren't going to class before or after, which I think is a good thing because mm -hmm. you shouldn't have to be distracted by other things when you're focusing on these exams and, and how important uh, they are. But it was interesting what Laura said earlier about how these exams are more open to interpretation. So it's almost like they have more of a college feel to them where mm – -hmm. Not not to say that, of course, there are things you take in college where there's a right and a wrong answer, but I think the ability to just to write, like I'm thinking to Harry's history of magic owl, right? Like his answer is not literally going to be the exact same thing as what Hermione or Draco or anybody else writes. So there is that flexibility in thought and and that doesn't exist really when you're taking more of those standardized tests to your point. Except the essay portion. I had a, an old English teacher who went down to Florida every year to read uh, essay submissions of I think the SATs, like the reading portion, um, by students nationally. So there were a couple of opportunities for independent thought, but even then I think the scope was really limited. And it's not like we're shooting spells or having to run an obstacle course or anything, which I think is always the coolest part about reading about Harry taking tests. Well, and much like uh, the real world, uh, there's a black market for drugs that will enhance your abilities <laughs> for taking these tests or for cramming Drugs and other nights. tools, yeah. <laughs> you have uh, Barufio's Brain Elixir, as well as Dingle's Powder Dragon Claw. Those are a few that are mentioned. And I think Barufio's Brain Elixir, you can actually brew in Wizards Unite, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Oh. So it is a real that is thing. A thing. Wow. <laughs> so are you cheating the, in Wizards Unite? Oh no, you're you're enhancing your ability to um I see. to defeat confoundables. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, and and the powder dragon Dingle's powder dragon claw is is I think a bunch of dung droppings from what Hermione says. Doxies, yeah. Doxy drops. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't want to take that. Or maybe you do. I don't know. Maybe it gives you a nice little kick. <laughs> Again, there's there's obviously direct comparisons that can be made to you know, young people who do take a lot of things to be able to stay up and and study over you know throughout the course of the night yeah oh god five hour energy exam. five hour energy monster just some good old coffee when we're kids we stay up late we're bad with time management and then of course test time comes and we have to cram it all in at the very last moment except for laura i'm sure she <laughs> yeah. planned out her schedule appropriately her and hermione were in bed by 10 p.m no <laughs> i wish yeah <laughs> i was the person who would stay up all night cramming before an exam as well i would stay up all night playing banjo kazooie or super mario 64 <laughs> and then at like 1 a.m i'd be like oh right i have a geometry test tomorrow hmm Oh, well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I know what I know, and I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> what is the circumference of Mumbo Jumbo's head? See, if they asked you that, Andrew, you, Good you would have been fine. 100 Eight reference. Yeah. <laughs> Eight pixels. Nice. Um, well, you got drugs, and you got cheating, too. So uh, there are bans that are on certain items during these exams. I feel like this is where maybe a Fred and George uh, item would come in handy, but... McGonagall specifically says there are no auto answer quills, remember alls, detachable cribbing cuffs, or self correcting ink allowed. Mm -hmm. Now, the first thing that came to mind is are these allowed normally? Like they're only <laughs> not allowed during owls, but you can use them any other time for yeah. another exam. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, Neville's grand sent him a remember all in Philosopher's Stone. So apparently. But. Was he using it to cheat? He wasn't using it to cheat. No, 
well, he he's too it innocent. Depends on the use. He's too innocent yeah. to use that to cheat. Yeah. I think the teachers probably keep an eye out for these various devices during a normal term, but then it's a lot more serious when you're trying to cheat during your owls. Yeah, it's the same way in that any major test, you're kind of, at the end of the day, it's up against you and the knowledge you've collected. Like, in any, in any situation, like, there's some things that will help get you prepared, but at the end of the day, you've got to face it. And I think that the uh, Hogwarts students in the fifth and seventh years, because seventh years are presumably sitting newts at the same time, uh, based on study patterns and things that we see in the hallways and the corridors. But it's at the end of the day, it's it's really about individuals' ability to test to mm-hmm. to to show their knowledge. So, anyone want to admit to cheating? Um. <sighs> No, I'd rather not admit to cheating. <laughs> That's an admission. Yeah, you know, in and since of kids are listening, maybe we shouldn't encourage it, of course. But I will say one uh, time I cheated that I was very proud of was in a history of this was in college, by the way, <laughs> a history of rock and roll class. <laughs> and during the test, there was like this listening portion where he would blast music and we had to identify the name of the song and the artist. And come to think of it, like, How could you study for that? There's a million songs out there. But anyway, (laughs) what I did is I had my iPhone one or whatever and uh, opened up Shazam and and used it to cheat on the listening portion of the test. Andrew. Modern technology foils. I'm so. (laughs) That's massively impressive. I'm so disappointed. (laughs) Oh, whatever, Laura. See how proud of me I'm impressed. Thank you. Yeah, Yeah, I was proud of that. See, what. What I find so interesting about it is that today the ability to cheat has to be so easy, so much like the resources are so much more readily accessible than they were when I went to school. Right? Like I, 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 when I went when I was in high school, we didn't cell phones. There were were no cell phones. There were no cell phones. Yeah, exactly. So. uh, or if they were, you know, they weighed like 40 pounds. So, yeah. <laughs> and it looked like you were calling outer space or something. So <laughs> right. You it, couldn't hide that under your desk. <laughs> yeah. So I just, I'm interested to know, like you're saying, you have a, literally an app that can give you the answers to a question. Your situation is a little bit unique, but but I also just think that, you know, having phones available to you, I got to imagine that's something that teachers are always asking students to put away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these days uh, but who knows if you have a teacher that's not really that attentive or aware i would assume you you could probably yeah. get away with quite a bit well and think about like even if a teacher confiscates phones there's apple watch now right you could you could l- presumably do things with the watch you hey know? siri what song is this yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i've definitely seen teachers who will you know on testing day have a basket on their desk and tell everyone to come put their phones in the basket but how do do you do that no no i your students no no um because like you know it's i I taught fairly small classes so there wasn't really going to be much of a chance to get away with something like that um Mm -hmm. i also think that i have a personal feeling that when you do stuff like that it automatically tells your students you don't trust them yeah Um, and i just i think that doesn't set a very great precedent personally but um you know for the teachers that do do that i I think about like how do you confiscate someone's watch (laughs) right give me your phone and your watch and your watch Mm. (laughs) and i mean now there's these rumors about apple working on glasses and it's going to be able to put information (laughs) right up on your glasses and like a heads-up display so uh, cheating is just going to get worse and worse i think what teachers just have to do. And now I'm not a teacher, so what do I know? But when a teacher walks around the room, that's effective, I think. It might stress out the students mm-hmm. a little bit, like they're staring at me. But you mm-hmm. make sure they don't have their phone out, they don't have any notes out. I mean, like students now, they have to take tests from home due to quarantine and COVID. Mm-hmm. I, <laughs> if I'm taking a test at home, it's easy. I'm cheating. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> what? Well, and a lot of teachers switch it to like be an open book test, right? Like right. We, we had a we did have a couple of those where it was like not so much pressure to um 
to to cram, but to be able to access the resources. Like those tests were the best because it was really about if you knew how to find the information. Yeah. And that is right. something mm-hmm. I was always more infinitely better at. And let's be honest, yeah. that's what we're going to do after we graduate. We're not going to remember every single thing and we're going to Google, we're going to look in books to get our answers. So in a way, yeah. it's the most practical type of test that prepares you for the future. Yes, I mm. agree. It is more reflective of life. Um, to that point, I would just like to bring up, we all remember being in high school in this country and our math teachers being like, you're never going to walk around with a calculator in your pocket. <laughs> well, guess <laughs> what? <laughs> Let's yeah, say our math do. teacher's names out loud right now. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Hate, Mr. <laughs> I had a crush on mine. I won't speak poorly of him. Um, yeah, no, but you're right. Math was always hard for me to to grapple with when it came to test time because it's like we're going to be using calculators anyway in the future. And do I need this math? No, of course not. Yeah. I mean, I understand the need to, you know, sort of have this wide scope of of learning. But what I like about the owls is, you know, it's really being able to set. It's not just a blanket statement where you know, you always hear, oh, well, you have to take these tests in order to be successful in life, right? Uh, but right. I, I do think the owls at least are setting up these students for a, a career path that they're interested in as of right now, whereas I don't necessarily think that that's what a lot of standardized testing here in the US does. It's, you're just taking it to take it. Um, and then just to wrap up the cheating piece, I mean, I'll speak for myself, but I would say probably most people, at least going back to pre-cell phone, like you would always look over at the person next to you at some point, or or, not every test, but like you do it. Yeah. Which letter did they fill in? Yeah, exactly. So (laughs) I think that that's fair to say. I'm glad you said it. Yeah, I I have no problem saying it. I did not. (laughs) No, look. (laughs) Well, that's because you, Laura, you were always at the front of the class. So you didn't. You, you, you <laughs> nice. turn... <laughs> I, yeah, I can't. I can't argue that. <laughs> so that if you turned around, it would be noticeable. Yeah, the teacher would notice. <laughs> well, Goody Two Shoes speaking, Hermione is confiscating other people's like coping mechanisms here. She's she's going around and she's really, but but in the case of the doxy dropping it's probably for the best but she's she's really like in addition to freaking out about her own knowledge level and i really appreciate ron again with the save at some point tells her hermione we said and agreed that we were not going to do this you're not going to talk about every test after we've taken the test because she can't let go which mm-hmm. is great i mean people are just, just i'm i feel bad that she's so high strung but she also is doing the job of two prefects right now because ron unfortunately it doesn't seem to be taking it as seriously he's more of let the children do what the children will do and hermione is just like no ron this is wrong but yeah i i feel like i've done that after exams though too where right you just you want to talk about the test yeah you, you want to kind know of like how a- you did what did your friends answer what did your your colleagues answer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think Hermione's a little bit obsessive here though, because she wants to talk through every question. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know how you have the kind of photographic memory where you can remember every question that was yeah. on there. I wonder if they're more like th- those quizzes with like two or three questions that just take a while to answer. Mm. I don't know. Maybe, but it, it's clear Hermione has anxiety. She has nerves about all of these exams uh, as do Harry run? I don't know. Like Ron seems like he's just kind of maybe he's still coming off that Quidditch high, but he's he's pretty calm throughout most of the chapter. And uh, but Harry, you know, he's he's dealing with some stuff himself. Um, but switching gears here, you know, let's talk about the actual owls. And uh, we're introduced to Griselda Marchbanks in this chapter, and. The trio are, are overhearing a conversation with her and with, with Umbridge, and you can tell she's definitely Team Dumbledore. <laughs> yeah. Where is he? Mm-hmm. And what? I, how old is she, first of all, if she sat Dumbledore's exam with him? Yeah. That's actually that's really old. What I want to know. Wow. But uh, – and, and take this as you 
will. Um, <laughs> there's, there's there's a quote from her that, you know, as they're talking about Dumbledore and, and Umber just saying that the ministry will, you know, at some point they'll they'll track him down. They'll they'll get him. Mm-hmm. And she responds by saying, "I I really don't think so." Dumbledore did things with a wand I've never seen before. <laughs> yeah. That's but my this only is a comment. very humbling moment in front of the trio for for Umbridge. Yeah, yeah. Griselda Marchbanks is somebody that Umbridge can't outwardly or directly oppose. So she's just forced to kind of sit and smile and and, and kind of change the subject. Well, and you know Umbridge mm. hates that people are missing Dumbledore and wondering where he is and then saying, oh yeah, there's no way you're going to be able to find him. <laughs> He does things with that wand. That man. Do we want to jump into some of these individual Yeah, I think we can breeze through Mm -hmm. these pretty quickly. There were some cool moments, I think, in in some of them. Others were just kind of touched on. uh, But the first one, Charms, uh, there's there's a question specifically on uh, Wingardium Leviosa, and it's a really nice throwback to Sorcerer's Stone. Yeah, I found it surprising that these owls, but I guess not surprising when you think about it, that these owls are really all-encompassing. It's not just the stuff they've learned in their fifth year, but it's everything they've learned at Hogwarts in their formal education up to this point. Mm. So the very first question, it also seems to be maybe arranged chronologically based on when they learned it. So I, I kind of liked that idea of <laughs> Here's your most basic form of magic, the stuff you covered in year one, and then it's gradually going to get more complex. The other one I would call attention to is defense against the dark arts. Yeah. And we know that this is really the one that Harry has been waiting for because and I think us as readers too, we we really wanted to see not just how Harry was going to do but really what the reaction of the room was going to be, in particular on the practical examination, right? We don't care about the written side of things because- Boring. It's just not not as cool, right? You don't get to see stuff happen. Mm -hmm. And and it's actually Malfoy who kind of gives Harry the the confidence that he needs in this moment. And uh, I was actually disappointed, and I know this is going off on a little bit of a tangent- that this wasn't in the movies. Mm-hmm. It speaks to Harry's education throughout the course of the series and how important Defense Against the Dark Arts is. And and I thought it would have been a really cool moment, not only if Harry had cast a Patronus Charm, but if others in the room that were a part of Dumbledore's army did the same thing. I know they do it all in the Room of Requirement, but just there are so many scenes that are kind of meshed together um, in the movie, right? Like when they're taking the owls, the owls actually end with Fred and George disrupting them and and them escaping, and and it's the owls are presented really as just like one examination, as opposed to however many this is over the course of two weeks. But Professor Tofty is is mightily impressed with Harry, uh, and and he's even willing to offer bonus points for for Patronus <laughs> Charm. Yeah, so I think Malfoy was kind of right. In, in his assertion earlier in the chapter, Harry's offered the opportunity for bonus points based on Professor Tofty, you know, being familiar with Harry's reputation. That does seem pretty unfair. Yeah. Hermione would kill for a bonus point. <laughs> I think and she has. And a CS Yeah. Oh, yeah. there oh, we go. Yeah. <laughs> Two birds with one mm-hmm. stone. Yeah, but it was it was really cool to see Harry conjure that Patronus, and so easily too. It just reminds you how far he's come from mm-hmm. having to practice a lot to being able to do it quickly on command. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he didn't know he would be asked to do that, and then he just busts one out, no problem. Well, and it's it's a throwback to the courtroom scene earlier when Umbridge really thought she had him, but w- the the first time that the room really broke was when Madame Bones, I want to say, asked Harry about his Patronus. Like, wait, you can you can produce a full one, right? And it's just like Umbridge cannot stand Harry's competence in this subject matter on a good day. And I think the unpleasant reminder of what happened to the court, like everybody's always asking Harry to conjure Patronus when he's in front of Umbridge. She, it's also a good moment for a twist in the book because Harry looks at her stupid, dumb face to conjure the Patronus and it works. And then he looks at her a little closer and she's actually smiling. 
And he's like, oh, shoot, what's she planning? Yeah, I wanted to highlight there's also a really um, what I think is a beautiful connecting the threads moment um, between Prisoner of Azkaban in this book, but also just um, this story uh, in general. We see the repercussions of Harry's private lessons with Lupin and Snape reflected during exams in this chapter. So obviously Harry's private lessons with Lupin and Prisoner of Azkaban totally paid off here whereas his private lessons with snape really <laughs> screwed him over yeah uh-huh. uh, yeah especially as we get to the end of the chapter he could have taken a few more of them yeah that's for sure and he could have had a better teacher <laughs> for sure but speaking of snape how about potions uh snape is nowhere to be found during this uh practical examination and uh I think this speaks to something we said in a previous episode where Harry actually feels like he didn't do half bad. And I and I think that's because Snape is not present in the room. He's yeah. not hovering over him or looking at him. And and I think that, you know, that's able to bring down Harry's anxiety levels a little bit and allow him to focus on what he's doing. Now, does he do great? We know from Half Blood Prince, you know, he doesn't achieve the highest level, but he certainly did better than expected. Yeah, and it's just so interesting that Snape is absent. I think we're meant to take it to believe that he's still avoiding Harry, and in this case, I think he has to avoid all the Gryffindors uh, in order to avoid Harry. But all the other teachers are kind of around when their exams are being taken. Umbridge is there for the DADA. Um, Hagrid is actually looking through his window during the Care of Magical Creatures Owl uh, Mm. later. So, like, the teachers are kind of taking an interest, and they're at least for what I presume to be moral support. But Snape is gone, and it actually works in Harry's favor, as you said. It's interesting. Snape didn't do it, though, to avoid stressing out Harry. Where was he? Was he helping Dumbledore? Did he just not care about the kids? I mean, I think he's just still angry at Harry. Right. He's he's like he doesn't want to be in the same room as him. And we don't know if Lupin told him you've got to teach the boy occlumency. And we don't know if Snape actively is like avoiding that. But he's avoiding Harry, I think, at all costs, it seems. Yeah. I could also see Snape just not caring to be there. Like, what's he going to do? What what does he bring to being present during an exam that he can't help anybody with? So mm-hmm. he's probably like, mm, that's a waste of my time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he spent the whole year teaching students or trying to get them up to the level. And if they either are or they aren't. Right. Uh, and, and I will say, like, I appreciate the fact that J.K. Rowling actually went into detail on all of these owls. I know we're jumping really to the ones that that stand out, but it just speaks to the fact that for us as readers, we've been with the trio really in all of these classes over the course of the last five years. And now we're finally getting to see the payoff. Like there's no just, Oh, I'm going to skip over transfiguration or herbology. There, there's actual detail given to, to all of those individual exams. Mm-hmm. I thought um, we could touch on Hagrid in particular, watching the examinations happen. He's sort of nervously watching from his cabin window, right? And I felt like, at least in my reading experience, it felt like Hagrid's reason for watching the exams take place was a bit different from the other teachers. And I think it's because Hagrid knows that how his students perform on their Care of Magical Creatures exam is going to be you know, directly reflective of how effective the ministry sees him as a teacher, whereas they may not do that to the other Hogwarts teachers, with the exception of friends, of course. Um, So just another example of discrimination happening in this book. Yeah, that's a that's a really great point. Well, let's talk a little bit then about what happens to Hagrid at the tail end of this chapter and to your point, Laura, that th- there is a level of discrimination that is going on here beyond just evaluating him and his ability to teach. And this this plays out in front of, of all of the students uh, that are taking the astronomy practical. And uh, it's really, uh, it's a heart-wrenching scene 
uh, because not only do you have him being attacked unaware, mm -hmm. you have McGonagall step in to try and help and her be attacked uh, as a result of that. And it just it just seems that this whole plan that's put in place by by Umbridge is is really it's it's not to expel him as a professor; it's to attack him for who he is. Yeah. Yeah, it's really hard to watch. And one thing I was curious about was the fact that they came to his door in the middle of the night. Of course, Harry is taking his astronomy test. Um, he's perfectly positioned to watch the whole thing go down. <laughs> what perfect timing. Did she strike in the middle of the night to get him when he least expects it? That's my guess. Yeah. Yeah, but but just the sheer amount of people she brought with her, surely that's unnecessary. And I think that is it it's though not... because she well, he still got away. So I think she knew they needed some manpower. But if you're talking about like a respect like of your colleagues, you would you would if you're gonna sack somebody, you would presumably like you'd bring maybe another witness, but not six other witnesses. Like she expected force and therefore that was what it eroded into. Yeah. Well also she just wasn't she wasn't just going down there to sack him. They were clearly trying to take him by force. That's the interesting part. Like what is the crime here? Like he he's he says I won't go to, won't go to Azkaban. Da, da, da. But I'm like why are what I I thought this was supposed to be about his incompetence and maybe maybe it's about the nifflers in the office that Lee Jordan put in there but I I just don't understand the logic of what this whole confrontation is about on the the superficial level I think it's a it's a show of force it's it's a show of power on the part of Umbridge and yeah she's not going there to sack him as I said earlier she could have easily done that the following morning by just notifying him, right? Hagrid is expecting to be yeah. let go at this point. I mean, that's why we have the whole scene with Grawl play out. I, I think that she's probably hoping to get some information from him that could be helpful in locating Dumbledore. Um, and, and she has ministry support here, right? Dawlish is there. And so she actually has Aurors who are assisting her, much like going back to the scene in, in Dumbledore's office. I, I just think this was about clear intimidation, fear, and we know who she is as a person. Hagrid is a half giant. She has no respect for Hagrid just because of that fact alone. And then the brutality with which she attacks and, and these ministry officials attack, Hagrid is defenseless in, in a way, right? He he doesn't have the ability to do magic, so it's not like he can respond in the same way. At least, you know, he's he's not as effective at it. We know that. So th this was like the perfect surprise tactic, I think, to the point that was raised earlier, the middle of the night, just going to like ambush him, essentially. Yeah, it's also interesting to see Hagrid's progression here as a character because you know, we see this is a also a connecting the threads moment back to Prisoner of Azkaban. There's there's this attempt by the ministry to, I, I think, indirectly discriminate against Hagrid because of Lucius Malfoy's influence. Right. Mm -hmm. So at the end of Prisoner of Azkaban, they're literally invading Hagrid's space in order to execute Buckbeak. They're doing <sighs> the same thing, but amplified here at the end of Order of the Phoenix. But in Prisoner of Azkaban, Hagrid's compliant. He disagrees with everything they're doing, and he's trying his best to build a defense for Buckbeak. But in the end, he complies with everything the ministry asks him to do. And at this point, he's like, uh, no more. <laughs> I'm done yeah. with you fools. I'm out of here. Yeah. And there's an uprising happening, and he's he feels like he's a part of it. He's part of the rebellion. It was interesting... Sorry to steal your note, Eric, that the spells are bouncing off of Hagrid. And that was that was cool to see, given everything that's going on. Yeah, I, I never quite feel I never feel like I'll fully grasp why that works, but it works. Because he's got thick skin. I think that's what's said in the book, right? <laughs> I mean, literally yeah, but, thick skin. But yeah, but a spell p would penetrate your skin, surely. Like the yeah. death curse isn't going to stop because you've got like a little bit more skin cells on top, you know. Well, like, and that and that jacket is heavy duty. I mean, that's that's pretty <laughs> thick too. So well, between the two, 
yeah, the comparison that that Hagrid um, is like thick skinned is also true with um, Dragonhide. Like a lot of substances in the Harry Potter books that are made of dragon skin and dragon hide are like mm-hmm. better at withstanding hot temperatures or better at withstanding spells. That's just it's it's almost cartoonish though the way that six aurors if they're all like dollish dollish is definitely there you know six ministry officials are just shooting spells at him and they're bouncing off or not affecting him meanwhile like mcgonagall comes out to stop the whole situation and four of those spells at once shot at her which is an excessive use of force yeah um unprovoked like they level her though they absolutely lay her out cold and Hagrid, meanwhile, with his half, not only full, half giant skin, is able to somehow, like, take all of them on and land some punches and then run away into the forest. Yeah. The attack on McGonagall was really sad to see. And again, right in front of students. Yeah. I, Umbridge must have known she would be doing this in front of kids. That might be something to add to the suck count. Well, it's 11 o'clock at night. Does she really think that? I mean, well, they are the sitting. the owls are going on. That's why I yeah. say that. Yeah. 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 I mean, under the cover of darkness, I guess. But and then as Eric mentioned a couple minutes ago, we do find out that Lee Jordan used the Nifflers. That was him who set the Nifflers free and he got them from the Weasley twins. The lesson here, panel, is we got to start reading ahead. On the other hand, it's kind of fun that we <laughs> kind of forget what happens in the immediate future, the little yeah, things. I like being surprised yeah. by it. Thank <laughs> you to everybody who corrected us and told us in advance that this yeah. was coming. Um, Just a few emails that came into the uh, <laughs> inbox about Nifflers and Lee Jordan. We actually have not read the Harry Potter books before. Surprise, we're going through no. these for the first time. Out of order. It's such a Out small fact, but I, I really... I don't know what I don't know what Lee was thinking, honestly. And he says Fred and George gave him their couple. Like, what are Fred and George doing with Nifflers? And where were <laughs> where were they hiding them? Because like I said last week, I feel like they would get out of wherever they were and yeah. wreak havoc over Hogwarts all the time. That's what Nifflers do. Yeah. I think though it, unfortunately it does give Umbridge at least a, another reason, whether justified or not to to go after Hagrid because he is a care of magical creatures professor. But look, I think people would notice if Hagrid was coming up to the school and dropping Nifflers in Umbridge's office again. It's the same thing with him getting out of the Quidditch match with nobody seeing him. It's, you know, look, he's he's a half giant at the end of the day. People are going to notice what he's doing. But so. can, we, can we talk again more about this attack on McGonagall? Because she is, like, she may not be headmistress. Umbridge is headmistress. But she's the deputy headmistress. She's the head of a Hogwarts house. The fact that she's coming down uh, the hill with the intention to stop just the violence and try and talk something out, she clearly is there as a peaceable person. She's not brandishing a wand or anything. And the fact that not Umbridge, I doubt Umbridge even fires a spell because she's so incompetent during all this. But the fact that Umbridge's soldiers shoot at and lay McGonagall flat for just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Hello, that speaks to a lot of what's been going on in the real world. Yeah, I think to the point of the the email at the top of the show, uh, you know, there's always a way to connect current events to what you're reading when the themes are so relevant as they are in the Harry Potter series that you know it, they're timely but they're also timeless because this has been an issue that has been going on for 400 years in our country and i would just say that the attack on hagrid actually that reminded me of the incident on on the murder, I should say, of of George Floyd, and the police, in this case the ministry, and their abuse of power, attacking a defenseless individual with the intent to harm him, mm-hmm. and the underlying racist tendencies towards, in this case, a half giant. And we we've learned a lot over the course of the Harry Potter series about how there are strong discriminatory policies in place against different types of people. Um, and th- that is no different than what is is happening right now um, in, in our country. And they know Hagrid is unarmed because they snapped his wand. 
They know he doesn't have a wand. He hasn't had a wand since he was 12 years old. They know he's unarmed. He's big. He scares them, but he's unarmed. There is there mm-hmm. is no need for six of them. Yeah, so after that whole evening of exciting events. Yeah, I don't think there's a an easy transition from that off to what happens at the end of the chapter, just that Harry has one more owl to sit, and, and that is History of Magic. And this is when his mind really starts to drift. He's clearly... <laughs> uh, consumed by what happened the night before mm-hmm. and uh, you know we're talking about not only the head of his house but a close ally in McGonagall who was attacked and and is now f- for the foreseeable future out of the picture yeah Hagrid also an ally is now out of the picture and so those who Harry can really trust and rely upon who are adults it, the list is dwindling yeah and mm-hmm. I don't even know who else would be a, a, a reference point for him right now if he needed something at the school. Yeah, yeah, and it, it was it was a really awful moment, of course. And then was it Lee Jordan who said, you know, they just watched McGonagall get attacked. Then, like seconds later, he's like, "Well, I'm off to bed. How can you go to <laughs> sleep after that? One of your teachers, a very good teacher, was just attacked. Two of them. I thought that was a little silly." But anyway, yeah, so Harry's feeling sleepy after a rough night. It's time for Voldemort to strike. I had some questions about the vision that Harry sees. Of course, it's it's all designed to get Harry to come to the ministry, mm-hmm. um, to the Department of Mysteries, and take the prophecy off the shelf. But Harry hears Voldemort telling Sirius to grab the what is the prophecy. He says, I cannot grab it, but you can. I think this is fundamentally just wrong, right? Because the prophecy can be grabbed by the people to whom the prophecy is being made about. So Harry and Voldemort, either of them could grab it from the shelf. The very notion that Voldemort needs Sirius 2, to which Sirius replies over my dead body or you'll have to kill me, is wrong. Right, it's just wrong information. But it it doesn't matter if it's correct. Voldemort's trying to lure Harry to where they are yeah yeah exactly yeah so so but here's the thing that gets me if the adults had actually just filled harry in on what the heck has been going on this year harry may have actually been educated on prophecies known that sirius could not touch it and then would have been able to suspect that voldemort was making up what was happening it would have given him an extra bit of ammo to say wait I this should can't stop be and right. think. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Looking back, my question for the panel and maybe even for the listeners, if you want to write in, what would have been the whole problem with telling Harry from the onset or or everybody that the weapon that everybody's been so damn secret about was a prophecy? Yeah. Like, say they reveal what it was from the get go. You have no book. You have no book five. I mean, like, but. Besides that, what 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 was so protective about the fact that it's a prophecy? Only Dumbledore like knows uh, what the contents of the prophecy are, but everybody assumes roughly what it's about, right? Like if if you were to tell the the Wizarding World in general, oh, there was a prophecy made, nobody's gonna be able to extra like get it all of a sudden. It's still gonna have the highest levels of security. So what would have been the harm in them saying at the beginning of the year? Voldemort is trying to get it into the Hall of Prophecy, and this is uh, why, because there was a prophecy. Right, and then educate him on prophecies. Yeah. What also cracks me up is Voldemort says in this vision, we have hours ahead of us and nobody to hear you scream. <laughs> Basically telling Harry, we're going to be here for a while. Wink, wink. <laughs> Coast is Take clear. your time. Come on in. We'll be here. <laughs> Figure out how to get your ass to London with uh, Hogwarts in a police state. Yeah, I have a feeling this may be a case where we find out some more context about this in future chapters. So we might start getting some emails from people being like, well, actually, they couldn't tell Harry because of X, Y, and Z. I'm willing to take that risk. Like, I genuinely mm-hmm. think <laughs> I, I genuinely think it's a little bit of a, uh, a play. I mean, do you have an inkling, Laura? Yeah, what Laura, might... what do you know? I'm not yeah. saying that I know anything. I mean, just thinking mm-hmm. thinking about what we know about Harry's character, he probably would have been goaded on to try 
and find the prophecy or try and fight Voldemort if he were led to believe that it had been prophesized that, you know, either he or Neville, but ultimately he was the one that had to defeat Voldemort. And if he had found that out at this point in the series, it it really could have messed up the trajectory for the rest of the books. Yeah, I but understand the characters may have had their reasons for not telling Harry. I'm just saying that Occlumency was a total waste. If Harry actually knew what Voldemort was up to, at least bits and pieces of it, maybe he yeah. would have been able to look at this vision he was ha- having and realizing that Voldemort was trying to play a trick on him. Yeah, and I mean, he spent all year dreaming about the the room and what's in the room and all this stuff. If they just told him, he wouldn't have been there. Wouldn't have been that yearning. Like the only reason Harry ends up going is because he's been so turned on and 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 um interested and intrigued by the mystery of it all all year long they could have removed that component and you get a much calmer harry with a much less dire need to go to london mm-hmm. yeah the thing is though harry's brain is a two-way radio in this book and i can see why given the fact that he's not performing very well at occlumency i can see why they would be hesitant to tell him too much because if he's not very good at shutting off his mind anything they tell him is a risk yeah yeah i think it's just like look we know it's a prophecy because what is voldemort like voldemort can't know that they know that he's looking for the prophecy they know they know he know, and he knows they know because they mm. keep stationing guards outside of the room. So he knows from the. I don't. I don't see it as a, a lost scenario. And then Dumbledore should have taken Harry under his wing and or or somebody earlier on for occlumency. But I don't want to nitpick the book. Obviously, it just you know, it's it's an open question. Um, yeah, there's no question though that more could have been done to to help Harry in this situation because now he's just at a point where. He's so vulnerable and yeah. he has nobody to rely upon to give him the information that he needs. At, at the very least, they could have given him more information when he was talking about the things that he was seeing instead of just saying, no, you got to close your mind. So I, I, I do agree with that point. Yeah. And as it relates to prophecies though, and I'm, I'm sure we've talked about this on the show at some point, but what would happen if somebody else grabs it? Is there just magic it preventing? Explode. <laughs> no, I don't. Yeah, I think there's magic preventing anybody but the two people who's the pro- who the prophecy is about from touching it. Well, they go crazy. Mm. That's what happened with Bode, right? He actually touched the prophecy. I think it was Bode. Mm. Um, like, but Bode was imperious to touch the prophecy, and it scrambled his brain. Um, it's it's a big deal, but I don't I don't think that's because it was a prophecy. I think that's because of the protections on it. Right. Well, and then who puts them there in the first place? Do they yeah. just pop up when a prophecy is made or do you have the unspeakables? No, in, in book one, baby Harry went and put the prophecy in the Department of Mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> it's for safekeeping. Yeah. It was on a that much lower sense. shelf mm-hmm. back then. No, it just, it seems a little silly in practice to me, but... Uh, also, yeah, I mean, we'll get into it in future chapters about how Harry should have been a little bit more uh, just aware of the fact that Sirius would never have put himself in that type of situation, despite how reckless he could be at times. I just I would guess they magically appear there when the prophecy is made, just magically appears over in the Hall of Prophecies. I believe that pretty interesting work on the part of the ministry to guide them there to have it be like in the ether that if a prophecy has been conducted it would show up in london or maybe it was always where prophecies showed up and that's why they built the department around it Mm. we have some pretty interesting questions to ask when we get into the various departments through the next couple chapters so i am looking forward to that but speaking of prophecies i predict that we will pass the umbrage suck count uh that the umbrage suck count will pass a hundred in the next episode. That's Ooh. my prophecy. Everybody Man. get well, ready. I think that's probably the last real chance we have, though, isn't it? <laughs> well, we better get a... Uh, Before get she gets centaured. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we have at least four for this chapter. Laura, do you want to take us through a few of these? 
Yeah. So first of all, being present at the Defense Against the Dark Arts exams to intimidate students, particularly Harry, F that. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, and then getting her henchmen together to try and overtake Hagrid in the middle of the night. <laughs> and then stunning McGonagall with an excessive use of force, no Ugh. warning, her deputy headmistress. <sighs> Does that deserve two? That deserves two. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> We're really trying to break a hundred. <laughs> And then doing these things in front of students. I know it was late at night, but I really think that Umbridge knew that some students would be able to see this from up at the astronomy tower due to them taking their owls. So that's 93. So we have seven more to go. We were confident that we would, we would get over 100. We'll see. Ooh, seven more to go. Okay, now it's time for MVP of the week. I'm going to give it to McGonagall for trying to help Hagrid, for being a strong woman, and uh, getting knocked down like that. That sucks. But good on you, um, uh, <laughs> good on you, McGonagall, for fighting the good fight. I'm going to give it to Ron for his level-headed approach, his new worldview following his Quidditch victory. Two weeks in a row. Ron, you the real MVP. Um, I'm going to give it to uh, Professor Tofty for encouraging Harry uh, in that moment to cast the Patronus charm and stick it to Umbridge. I'm going to give it to Hagrid. Need I say more? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> you need not. We didn't talk about... Oh, actually, you know what? This is a retroactive um, <laughs> um, Umbridge suck count, <gasps> but Fang... Hagrid, oh, had, yeah. There is animal abuse in this chapter. Ah, uh, <laughs> thanks for catching that. There we go. Six. Hagrid has to drape poor Fang over his shoulders. Ah. Okay, we're at ninety-four. You guys, we got this. Now let's rename the chapter "Order of the Phoenix," Chapter Thirty-One: Ordinary Wizarding Lawlessness. Ah, starting to sound like a security nightmare. Starting to sound like a uh -oh. security nightmare. Security nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, Chapter Thirty One: Rubius Hagrid's Punch Out. <laughs> I like that one. I like that was better than last week's. Oh, thanks. I will go with uh, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, Chapter Thirty One: Naughty Nifflers. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, Chapter 31, Knock'em Sock'em Hagbots. Nice. It's for all you <laughs> okay. 90s kids out there. There you go. <laughs> well, that was a fun discussion. If anybody has any feedback about what we had to say on today's episode, send it on in via the MuggleCast contact form on MuggleCast.com or email MuggleCast at gmail.com. You can also use that email address to send us a voice memo. And you can also uh, reach out to us the old-fashioned way with a telephone. Our number is 19203Muggle. That's 19203684453. You'd think I'd have that memorized by now, but I don't. I was just thinking, when's the last time we mentioned the P.O. Box, too? P.O. Box, yeah. If you want to send us a goat or <laughs> you have some feedback, you'd prefer to handwrite it, where can they send that? That's uh, 4044 North Lincoln Avenue. Box 144, Chicago IL 60618. Again, thanks uh, to all of the people who sent us. Um, I know Sonia sent something recently to us. And, uh, well, yeah, the we tweet. Got a couple Printed of things. on a canvas. Yeah. yeah, and the face masks. All kinds of things coming in there. So thanks to everybody who reaches out via the P.O. Box. It's time now for Quizage. Last week's question, who is the head of the Wizarding Examinations Authority? The answer, of course, is Griselda Marchbanks. Congratulations to Darth Ferrix, Sup Sarah, <laughs> Samwise Potter Skywalker, Reese Without a Spoon, Stesh Me a Picture, Caitlin the Greatlin, Robbie Stillman, Sarah A.K. Weensy, Bronkers Bricks, Count Revioli, and Jason King. Okay, next week's question. What curse is umbridge prepared to use on harry hmm i think i might know this one actually oh well you should uh submit the answer to us over on twitter at mugglecast using hashtag quizich all right 
And by the way, people might be asking, when are you having your next live Quizage? It will probably be towards the end of July. Hint, hint. Wink, wink. What anniversary is at the end of July? Thank you, everybody, for listening to this week's episode. We will be back next week. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.